Ostensibly, this video is about a letter to a man you've probably never heard of. But as I go, you'll find yourself discovering that what I've actually done is prove most of what the average person was taught about the indigenous populations of the Americas was a badly written fiction. Don't worry. I cite my sources. I have plenty of visuals. This will be a very easily digested analysis. But whoa doggies, does it have a doozy of an ending. So rather than leave you guessing where I was going with all of it, I thought I'd bury my lead by putting it right up front. Um, also, before I begin in earnest, I want to firmly establish an incredibly important consideration. Manage expectations. I am not the all-native. None of us is. I wish it didn't have to be said, but I found in my many years of work and research into native history, I have to account for those who've read Black Elk Speaks or saw that meme about the two wolves, and it really spoke to them, so they want it to be truer than it is. There was, is, and can't be a single indigenous culture. So please don't regard this as a comprehensive sociolinguistic history of two continents worth of people. In fact, what I'm going to demonstrate is a comprehensive sociolinguistic history of all the Americas isn't currently feasible, based in part on the previous perfunctory comprehensive sociolinguistic history of the Americas perpetuated by a lot of previous researchers and most current school history textbooks, a model which boils down to barring a few notable exceptions, we were all illiterate vagabonds wandering around trying to invent the wheel until European colonists and conquistadors came and civilized us all. This is what we in the biz like to call bigoted gibberish, but thanks to that model, it's currently unfeasible to write a new history just yet, for reasons that I will explain. First things first, I would like to introduce you to something collectively called Indian Sign Language, also known as hand talk, Plains Indian Sign Language, and Native American Sign Language. This is a map of just the primary language families in just the now continental United States around roughly the 17th century. Notice this map is already excluding two-thirds of North America and all of the Caribbean, the Pacific and Atlantic Islands, and all of South America. Which means when I show you this map of the rough coverage of Plains Sign Language, you can appreciate just how incredible and adaptable this language truly was. Hand talk was developed primarily as a trade dialect to facilitate negotiations between groups and to overcome the grammatical and syntax issues learning a full language can often entail. Records of it are part of the earliest European accounts of the continent. Devaca mentions it in 1527 and Coronado again in 1541. Arguably one of its most famous uses that the average person in the US would know about was in perpetuating the ghost dance religion of Wovoka. Of course, the reason the average person is aware of it is because the ghost dance was a contributing factor to the Wounded Knee Massacre, a massacre commemorated to this day in the Lakota lands, as shown in this photo from the Rapid City Journal. This is the native slaughter that they used to call Custer's Last Stand before people started to accept that Custer was a terrible person who massacred children and elders in their beds because he thought it made him look powerful. The reason that it's important here is Wavoka was a Paiute. Uh, that's a tribal group whose lands were primarily west of the Rocky Mountains, and part of his vision was a desire to bring unity to the tribes to stand against encroachment. Wovoka himself was from western Nevada, but the ghost dancers killed during the Wounded Knee Massacre were among the Lakota, a tribe east of the Rockies up closer to the Great Lakes in the Dakotas. These groups were not next-door neighbors, but you'll notice both regions are covered by the Hantock area and both had members who started following Wovoka's message. That's not just an interesting coincidence. It's also no coincidence that throughout those regions, there is a vast quantity of indigenous rock art normally called petroglyphs. This, for example, is Newspaper Rock Monument in Utah. It's so famous it actually got a reference in the Honest Hearts DLC for Fallout New Vegas. Or maybe you're more familiar with Coco Pelli, the flute player dude that is in every New Age store in the world. He's all over the place in these regions. It's why he's so popular right up to today. From Lower Sand Creek in the Grand Staircase and Abo, New Mexico in the west, to Mississippian effigy pipes to the east, this vision of a guy with a bend in his back, a song in his heart, and a stick in his mouth is all over the place. Uh, incidentally, clearly he has a flute in a lot of this, but equally clearly he also has what's called a chin stick which is a cane that you use to stand in place to rest while you're carrying a heavy load, meaning he's a traveling trader who would have found a trade language like hand talk extremely useful. Not surprising, he shows up in a lot of the same places hand talk was common, 
Hopefully you're wondering where this is going. Well, I'm glad you asked. This is a letter, believe it or not. It was written to a man named Bella Kozad when he was living at the Carlisle Indian Boarding School in Pennsylvania in 1890. It was sent to him by his family back in the Oklahoma Indian Territory. Kozad was a member of the Kiowa Nation, and after he returned to his reservation in Oklahoma, an anthropologist found the letter and donated it to the Smithsonian, where a linguist decided to try and decipher it. Based in part on the groundbreaking work into Native Sign by Garrick Mallory in his text, Sign Language Among North American Indians Compared with That Among Other People of the Deaf Mutes, which was published in 1881, this linguist recognized some of the images that seemed to resemble hand talk gestures. Now, Mallory was definitely a product of his time. Sections of his text include titles like Gestures of the Low Tribes of Man, so I'm not suggesting anyone run out and try to find a copy of his stuff. There's much better and decidedly less overtly racist research available these days. But it got us Bella's letter, so small blessings, I guess. The Smithsonian researcher, now in possession of the letter, traveled to visit Kozad, who not only translated the letter, but also demonstrated several other Kiowa could read it as well, along with mentioning he'd originally been taught to read it by his grandparents. Notice I said read there. See, at the time he was admitted to Carlisle, he was listed as illiterate, a fact that's going to be really important in a second, so just hold on. Kozad identified several sections of the letter which provided the researchers with the necessary insights to tie together the symbols and what he would read of Mallory, the most significant of which was this piece here at the bottom of page one. That passage details how Kozad's fourth brother had died and was buried following a ceremony. The reason it's important is these were the symbols that were clearly similar to hand gestures from Kiowa Plain Sign Language for indicating four brothers now become three because one is in a box in the ground. A passage near the end of the letter shows that a friend had been out singing the requisite peyote songs for several nights in the direction of the Morning Star. Kozad's letter is now housed at the Dickinson Research Center at the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum in Oklahoma City. The reason it's achieved such respected status among the mere handful of researchers who are aware of it is this is more than simply an interesting variation on drawing pictures. Kozad's people were, at the time, embracing what has become uh, the peyote church. This is a religious practice which combines several different elements into a single ritualistic approach that's then represented at the opening of the letter in the form of a blessing. But here's the thing. This is a petroglyph from the Torrey Canyon petroglyphs in Wyoming. According to the Kiowa's own stories and the archaeological evidence, this petroglyph is from the same region that the Kiowa's lived in for generations. Now notice how the letter is divided. It's laid out identically to the petroglyph, and it uses the same symbols in the same way. Blessing above, text to follow. What if the rest of those symbols on that stone are equally as precise as Kozad's letter? Well, ever been to a museum? I gotta say, some museums can be pretty boring. But the ones that are not, the ones that seem to be almost viscerally engaging, at least to me, are the ones they call immersive museums. Like this one the National Postal Museum's William H. Gross Stamp Gallery. Look at this thing. I cannot think of a more tedious subject than an entire museum dedicated to stamps. It is so easy to screw that up. You just make it case and case of sheets of stamps with a wall of text explaining them in all of their tedious glowing detail. So they didn't do that. Instead, they made it a wall of visual noise with twists and turns and who knows what's around the next corner. Maybe it is boring in person, but it doesn't set the visitor up to expect that. Or, if philately isn't your thing, how about the Temple of Dender at the Met? I've been there. I've walked all through it. Believe me, this thing is imposing. Walking into it really does give the visitor a sense of how freaking huge Egyptian temples were. And that's the reason that full immersion exhibits work. It's because that's how we live our daily lives. It puts us into that place. Better than a long-winded explanation, anyway. You don't walk into a town with plaques and labels explaining everything. You walk in surrounded by symbols you recognize. Word fragments and partial images aren't just confusing, because you're already aware of the meaning behind them. Times Square in New York may be visually loud, but there isn't a thing in it that the average pedestrian would find entirely and completely alien. Well, it shouldn't come as a screaming shock that all these ancient cities that we find throughout the Americas, also full of images and iconography and symbols, would be equally familiar to their inhabitants. 
possibly just as visually loud, but far from baffling. Given that reality, the relevance of the Bellicose Ad Letter is difficult to overstate. There's a reason that grade school history books still to this day remember the burning of the library at Alexandria and the barbarian hordes sacking Rome. So total was the loss of collective cultural knowledge following each of those events that when copies of the texts which had been preserved in the Eastern Roman Empire, aka Byzantium, were rediscovered and transported back into Western Europe, it spurred what we now literally call the rebirth of civilization, the Renaissance, which eventually became the Enlightenment, literally the bringing of the light. This is the history that all of those white nationalists are pointing to when they say Western civilization. Sure, they like to throw in Viking heroics in their occasional costuming, and they totally ignore the reason that Europe was rediscovering the texts was thanks to the Muslim Middle East. But when they talk about how it was a good thing that they conquered all of us savages to improve us, what they're actually referencing is Athenian philosophy, Babylonian algebra, Egyptian geometry, and Sumerian law copied by the Greeks, burned by the Romans, and preserved by the Muslims to be handed back to Europe when it was finally ready to grow up. Within only a few decades, the first universities were being founded. Names that still ring out to this day as bastions of learning and scholarship, the Sorbonne, Heidelberg, Oxford, Given that reality, it should come as no surprise to anyone that the oldest recorded university in the modern sense of that word was the University of Karouin in Morocco, founded in 800 by those same Muslims. Oxford wouldn't be founded for another 300 years. The Sorbonne wouldn't arrive for another 450. Oh, uh, Central America also had universities of their own by that period, since that seems to matter to people obsessed with advanced civilizations. In fact, we've now come to define the very concept of civilization as relative to the possibility of literacy. From Thomas Aquinas to Jared Diamond and Jordan Peterson, if a culture doesn't have writing, so the narrative goes, then they're not actually a culture, they're just a tribe, a loose affiliation of related families with no real structure, mired in the chaos of faulty memories with no history except stories and, you know, what good are mere stories after all? It also happens to be the reason that the Europeans had such an obsession with burning books as a synonym for destroying a culture, because it had such deep roots in their own history, which is why it's one of the first things the Spanish did when they arrived in the Americas. For example, Diego de Landa Calderón, who in 1562 destroyed thousands of Mayan artifacts and deerskin books because he had decided they were satanic, a fact he is celebrated for right up to this day, by the way. Uh, specifically, he said, we found a large number of books in the characters, and they contain nothing in which were not to be seen as superstition and lies of the devil. We burned them all, which they, the Maya, regretted to an amazing degree, and which caused them much affliction. Notice how he sounds almost surprised, or maybe vindicated. And not to be outdone, Spanish authorities back in Europe were equally concerned with making sure as much information as possible was destroyed. When Bernardino de Seguin's manuscripts on Aztec culture traveled back with him, including the records of conversations and interviews with indigenous sources in Texcoco and Tenochtitlan, and likely to have included much primary material which didn't get into the final codex, they were confiscated from him and burned. The destruction of these codices is so famous that in 2011, a man named Greg Prescott briefly made the news by claiming that thousands of previously unknown codices had been discovered in the basement of a Los Angeles museum. The story quickly unraveled when he couldn't produce a drip of proof, but the fact it made the news at all is testament to how many documents we know were lost to begin with. He claimed thousands had been uncovered, and that wasn't the part that scholars had trouble believing. The reality is, of the unknown number of documents destroyed, only four are known to exist, and of those, the Grolier Codex is partially destroyed. It should not come as a raging shock to anyone that indigenous accounts of native tribes are even more rare. An example would be the accounts of the Chichimeca Nation by Nando de Alva Ixlirxochit, which originally compiled in 1640, was first translated into English in 2010. But remember, Landa didn't just destroy books, he destroyed statues and icons too. 
He knew the power of those symbols and the potential messages that they hid. Camouflaging intent from the colonizers was nothing new to the Americas. It's possibly one of the few truly universal pan-Indian and even Afro-Indigenous traditions that one could identify, from voodoo practitioners using saints icons to represent their spirits, to, say for example, letters seemingly written in gibberish, to these Navajo actors in the film A Distant Trumpet being subtitled as negotiating with a cavalry officer, when in fact that's not even close. Yeah, that's the thing though. Like the codices and the work of Don Fernando, the COZED letter proves a symbolic written language coordinate with a gestural trade dialect was not only feasible, it existed. It was real and a valuable tool for preserving culture despite direct efforts to the contrary. From the Maya to the Aztec, from the Inca to the Mississippians, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that cultures throughout the Americas were rich with the written word. This is not just a matter of Central American empires, gigantic stone monoliths, or carved plaques either. This is the Calrita petroglyph stone in the Maracas Valley on the island of Trinidad. Or how about La Ceneguilla in New Mexico? And probably the most important of these images is one that you've never heard of. This is the Piazza Bird of Alton, Illinois. He's important for a bunch of different reasons. The one that's most obvious for those even remotely familiar with iconography of the southeastern woodland tribes, the Caribbean or Central America, is that it's a feathered serpent with horns. That image appears all throughout the Americas. We love us some flying reptiles, from Quetzalcoatl to Kukulkan, Tetshien to Uctina, even Serpent Mound in Ohio and the Serpent Bird of the Nazca Lines. Snake plus bird was so common, it even adorns the Mexican flag to this day. If you have a tribe even vaguely connected to the Mississippi, the Gulf Coast, or the Orinoco River Delta, they probably have a story about a smart snake that had feathers on it, or at the very least an otherworldly shimmer, and had some serious magical powers. Frequently, they were one of a set of twins. Often they brought healing, or at least wisdom, sometimes they brought civilization itself, and occasionally they were so smart and wise and powerful, they were best avoided. But holy crap, were they all over the place. Which kind of suggests a common conceptual forerunner which might have been familiar to most people, and maybe even gotten written down somewhere and shown up in buildings and texts all over the place. Hmm. Overly sarcastic productions discussed part of this in their video on Quetzalcoatl. You are the Pulk God, the Fat God, the oh-so-charming Flayed God, and the Feathered Serpent. This, the Feathered Serpent on the side of the third largest pyramid in Teotihuacan, is the first recognizable reference to the god that would come to be known by the Aztecs as Quetzalcoatl. Although it is worth noting that the earliest representation of Feathered Serpents, although not necessarily as a singular deity, date all the way back to the Olmecs in 900 BC. Now obviously, cultures swap gods all the time, the Romans being particularly egregious in this regard. And while the Flayed God also shows up later in a few places as a god of household chores, household chores, the man has no skin! The feathered serpent appears to be by far the biggest contribution that Teotihuacan affected on the greater Mesoamerican belief system. And unlike the Romans, who took totally separate gods and acted like they were the same under different names, in this case, the Mesoamerican feathered serpent really does seem to be all the same god, but known by different names and different tribes. The Nahuatl called him Quetzalcoatl, while the Yucatec Mayans called him Kukulkan, and the Quiche Maya called him Kukumats. I'm definitely saying that wrong, I apologize. Pretty much every Mesoamerican tribe had a feathered serpent, some kind of interpretation of the original Teotihuacan god. And given that Teotihuacan had clearly been a trade hub, it kind of makes sense that some of their gods might have gone out along trade routes. Quetzalcoatl is functionally much, much older and more widely worshipped than any of the other Aztec deities, which you can actually kind of tell just by virtue of how little is said about him. Don't follow? See, old gods have a tendency to fade into cultural ubiquity because everybody worships them, everybody knows them, so why would they write about something everybody already knows? It would be like if somebody wrote a step-by-step -step instruction manual on how to operate a flush toilet or made a 20-foot sculpted frieze describing the fitness gram pacer test. Why would you do that. So as a result, we find terse references that imply a backstory we can't find and maybe stories that weren't even written down because they were probably just known by everybody. Whereas we took a Pochley's single noteworthy story is perfectly documented, the Feathered Serpent is a mess of fragmented legends frequently referencing facts or events that probably used to be well known. There are very scattered myths describing his birth, but most of them sound kind of like, and this was the birth of Quetzalcoatl, with no further explanation about who he is or why it's a big deal, like it's some big pop culture reference or a sweet cameo everyone would get. There's a Yucatec Maya version where his birth 
Alice's story is basically that a snake is born to a human family, and his older sister explicitly recognizes the snake as the feathered serpent god. So he's clearly a pre-existing player, and not even his origin story is properly explained where he comes from. And in contrast, Wheat's the Pugsley's origin story explicitly ends with a why you should care explanation, assigning him the ability to keep the world from getting eaten. Quetzalcoatl never gets that treatment, probably because he never had to, which means us modern people, who lack the cultural ubiquity and the context that would have existed at the time, have no idea what his general deal was. But anyway. Here's the thing, though. This painting isn't a restoration, it's a recreation. The original Piazza, which was recorded by Jacques Marquette in 1673, was destroyed when they were carved from the rock face to transport them to a museum. Hey, so totally fun unrelated random fact. Uh, when Puerto Rican archaeologist Rene Rodriguez Ramos first stumbled onto a collection of ancient pre-contact Puerto Rican stone carvings back in 2001, some of which had been looted and taken to the Smithsonian, the artifacts were so unappreciated that one of them was literally being used as a doorstop. They were discovered in Puerto Rico in the 1880s by a priest, Jose Maria Nazario, who was convinced that they were a link to one of the lost tribes of Israel because, of course, native people can't be smart. When it turned out that was not true, the stones were declared forgeries in the early 1900s by researchers from the Smithsonian Institution. I don't know why that would occur to me to include at this point. Moving on. Rodriguez noticed that the stone carvings followed a recognizable pattern. As of the end of 2019, he'd identified over 20 symbols, which repeated throughout the over 300 stones. It feels noteworthy at this point to say that an article which ran in the Miami Herald discussing this find felt it also necessary to point out that the Taino and Kalinago, the tribes who are indigenous to the Caribbean, quote, had no trace of a written language. Tr truly? That, that seems like a really odd fact to include given the article they're including that fact in. I guess we're just supposed to forget the fact that they were an hour's canoe ride from some of the most verifiably literate cultures in all of the Americas, at least one of which, we have verifiable proof, invented the zero independent of Mesopotamia and nearly a thousand years before Fibonacci carried it over to Europe from North Africa. These fragments of information are even more frustratingly tantalizing when compared to cultures with even less documentation. For example, the Papal V a singular compilation by Dominican friar Francisco Jimenez of the stories of the Quiche Maya in Guatemala. It has a passage that details a method for calculating the golden ratio. So significant did they believe this calculation to be, it appears at the beginning of their creation story. Now sure, it's easy to say this is a religious text, and so it shouldn't be understood in such terms, but frankly, Pythagoras gets all the credit now, and he was such a religious zealot, several historians from ancient Greece stated that he declared that due to the transitive property, eating beans was a sin because it was a form of cannibalism. That's not a joke, by the way. So if that guy can get credit for how to figure out the area of a triangle, which he may or may not have even done, the Popova can get credit for the divine section, which it demonstrably had. The Maya are saying mathematics is the language with which God wrote the universe, and they were saying it several centuries before Galileo stole the line. We have anointed Egypt and Sumeria as the cradles of civilization for significantly less. They had no books, no writing, no symbolic communication, apart from all the books, the stone petroglyphs, and Wait a minute, those stone tablets that Rodriguez just found that were gathering dust in some closet when they weren't being used to keep the office fan from rattling too loudly? Didn't Landa brag about how he destroyed a bunch of statues and figurines too and how distraught the locals were at their loss? Hopefully you're beginning to see my point. The evidence of a variety of written symbolic languages is all throughout the Americas. In fact, when Sequoia first developed what has come to be known as the Cherokee syllabary, it was rumored that he based some of his initial attempts on a collection of local rock art. For years, this was dismissed as complete fantasy because everyone knew Sequoia had learned how writing works by being around European settlers and being apprenticed as a printer, which resulted in him just reusing the printed letters to make up his codex. Never mind a syllabary is nothing like an alphabet, and that whole swaths of the symbols in his overall system aren't used in any other printed language common in the states at the time, and so wouldn't have been available from any typographer of the period, this hand-waving dismissal reigned supreme until archaeologists like Jan Simic began documenting ritual cave paintings in the Tennessee region that date back from 1,000 to over 5,000 years. 
Incidentally, one common image of those petroglyphs and paintings is a winged serpent, but several of them also happen to look just a bit like some of the symbols in Sequoia's chart. Oh, by the way, if you look up the story of Sequoia's syllabary, to this day you will find people who say that he was originally ignored by tribal leaders because they thought what he was doing was a form of witchcraft. Given that he finalized his system in 1821, and by 1828 there were so many literate Cherokee they had a newspaper, the Cherokee Phoenix, that would mean the entire Cherokee nation underwent a complete religious conversion and achieved full literacy in around five years. They must have been exhausted. Or maybe, just maybe, they were already familiar with symbolic communication, and Sequoia's true genius was adapting the printing press to their needs. Once again, of course, it couldn't be that. It also couldn't be that Sequoia had also studied Cyrillic and Latin and found neither of them useful for his purpose, and that's why it took him less than a decade to create an entire written system out of thin air. No, he was a miracle baby who dragged his people kicking and screaming into movable type and Hegelian rationalism. Like our own adorable little allegory of the cave. You know... You read enough settler histories of indigenous tribes, and you eventually start to wonder how it is that natives remembered to even breathe long enough to survive so that Europeans could show up and teach us all how to human correctly. Now, though Simic has published some of his findings, he has aggressively avoided publishing the locations of the petroglyphs themselves to make as sure as possible that they're not looted or vandalized or carved to pieces and disappeared into someone's closet to end up lost in time. I can't think why he'd be worried about that happening. By the way, the first issue of the Cherokee Phoenix, as I said, it came out in 1828. The petroglyphs of Puerto Rico were identified by Father Nazario in 1870, and the Bellicozad letter was sent in 1890, which would either mean in the span of one generation, three separate people randomly invented completely separate written languages out of some occult mixture of telepathic communication and randomly scratching on rocks until they made a shape, or the basis for symbolic recorded languages existed throughout the Americas and has been ignored, erased, and then assumed impossible because it was ignored and erased. And that's not even getting into the Kipu knot rope language of the Inca, which was thought to be a simple abacus until Manny Madrano, a Harvard math undergrad, realized that the color coding of the strings corresponded to the names recorded in a contemporaneous Spanish census meaning those knots are way more than just digits on a primitive spreadsheet? Or how about Rapa Nui, uh, also known as Easter Island? It has pictograms, which are currently called Rongo Rongo. It took, I guess we have to call them scholars, nearly a century to agree that those were in fact written languages at all, and there are still a few who aren't on board. The very definition of what constituted communication was specifically encoded to exclude our realities. Circling back around to hand talk, I told you I'd get there. Though Gallaudet University is rightfully recognized as one of the first all-deaf schools in the United States, its foundation was that in 1864, Amos Kendall adopted several deaf children, put them in a school on his own land, and it took a full year after it was built to be recognized as a school at all. It was also one of only a handful that used sign language rather than focusing on teaching deaf children to speak and read lips, what's now called the oral method. Now conversely, a school for deaf children was opened in Guthrie, Oklahoma by the deaf couple Mr. and Mrs. Ellsworth Long in 1898. In 1908, it moved to Sulphur and has now become the Oklahoma School for the Deaf. Considering the tiny number of deaf schools throughout the rest of the entire United States at the time, the fact that there was a school for deaf natives in an area which wasn't even a state yet, only 30 years after the first deaf school in the entire U.S., deserves significantly more attention than it generally receives. And remember, the Kozad letter was sent from the Oklahoma Territory to Bellow in Pennsylvania's Carlisle Indian School. The fact that a native-born deaf person could more easily function in everyday native society in a way nearly impossible in non-native society cannot be ignored nor can the fact that deaf native history is fundamental to understanding native symbolism throughout the Americas. These were our people, and they have been almost entirely erased from the history books right alongside our literacy, our languages, our books, our truth. And yet, when reading research on modern-day deaf natives, such as that performed by Sharon Baker in 1974 and Melanie McKay Cody in 2019, one of the most powerful emotions that comes through in their research is shame, 
shame at not being able to fully participate in cultural activities, shame at being less able than their hearing counterparts, and most of all, shame at the hands of their own families because of rejection and isolation. The legacy of the boarding schools and the dehumanization of the integrationist model really is impossible to summarize. This cultural isolation is so profound, it directly affects whether native deaf are even calculated in comprehensive statistics. As noted by Dr. Damara Paris in this Indian Country Today article from 2013, studies attempting to identify the number of deaf natives are designed primarily by non-natives, which means the categories of sign speaker and native are sometimes mutually exclusive because there's rarely, if ever, a category for speaker of plain sign. Hard of hearing and deaf may also not be differentiated, and data gathering may not have bothered asking reservation schools at all, meaning a deaf native often gets to choose to be deaf or brown, but not both. But the real history of our people just doesn't bear out those distinctions. For example, recently discovered masters from the 1919 silent film Daughter of Dawn further attest to the ubiquity of hand talk. Recorded using an all-native cast in Oklahoma, there are entire scenes of people having a conversation, telling a story, or making a speech, all of which are performed in PISL by apparently hearing participants. deaf native standing in that crowd would have known exactly what everyone was talking about without ever having to consider themselves as an outsider looking in. Once again, that film was thought lost or destroyed decades ago. The Oklahoma City Museum of Art finally had to pay a private investigator $5,000 to uncover its remains based on rumors that fragments of it still existed, and it took him two years to complete the job. Of course, at this point, a modern Eurocentric revisionist could step in and say that these indigenous populations were simply copying previous societies, taking the symbols but not the meaning. But then that charge can just as easily be leveled against Europe. They have no culture. They only have a pale copy of Athens and Babylon. Somehow, I don't think they'll be willing to apply the same standard to themselves. More importantly, they're ignoring that their own supposed civilized sources also reference this hand talk. Devaka and Coronado were traveling through the plains less than 30 years after Columbus landed in the Caribbean. That's not a lot of time for a gestural language to spread throughout half of a continent so that they could run into it nearly everywhere they went. Oh, uh, by the by, one of the villages that Coronado recorded as belonging to the Quivira people, which is likely what became the Wichita tribe, has since been identified in eastern Kansas. It goes by the name Etzanoa, and following excavation and analysis, best current guess is that it had a population of at least 20,000 people. For perspective, that would make it somewhere near the size of London or Madrid at the same period. These were not semi-nomadic hunters, dear listener. The simple fact is, in these tiny pockets of memory and culture, was preserved a facet of our biography that has only barely been explored because it was both passively and actively suppressed. <laughs> 
one of the only modern Indian Sign Language Councils, was held in 1930, gratefully just in time for it to have been captured on disintegrating black and white film, elders from the Cheyenne to the Blackfeet to the Choctaw gathered in Montana to hand talk stories and recite histories. It was part of a three-day film project held by Hugh L. Scott, a 77-year-old U.S. Army general, and the footage almost immediately disappeared into the National Archives, only to be rediscovered 80 years later. Funny how all of my stories keep ending that way. Disappeared somewhere, only to be rediscovered by a relative who gave a shit two lifetimes later. Would it shock anyone that in the middle 1800s, that's the same period when eugenics was starting out? A fake science dogma that called for the sterilization of natives and deaf in equal measure, creating policies that were in place right up to the current day? It's almost as though there was a concerted effort to hide or destroy any evidence that natives were every bit as advanced as any civilization in Europe, and that the deaf are not feeble-minded drains on collective resources, but active and vibrant contributors to culture, specifically to justify wiping them out entirely. But here's the thing. We didn't disappear. Frankly, the footage speaks for itself, literally. Maybe in some small way, plain sign is our Byzantium. I couldn't say. Really, there's no way to know. But there is one thing it proves beyond a doubt. We were never savages. We were never just a collection of meaningless mythologies. We were recorded that way by outsiders, and the story was complete fiction. In 2012, to commemorate the 1930 conference, 50 hand talkers from throughout the United States gathered to tell stories, share histories, and celebrate. They are still here. We are still here. With all of that said, a few things to consider going forward. I am not suggesting that all tribes throughout the Americas spoke some universal dialect creating a comprehensive pan-Indian superculture. As that 1930s conference demonstrated, there were dozens, possibly hundreds of dialects, and as the signers indicated, many of them were mutually unintelligible. Instead, think of the example of Latin. The English word phrases, I got up on the wrong side of bed and we got off on the wrong foot as standard terms for a situation which started bad and hasn't improved, comes from the Roman superstition that the right side of the body is good and the left side is bad. Literally, the Latin word for left side is sinister. What I'm getting at is, it means that it was the Romans who thought that if you entered a home with your left foot or exited the bed on the left side, you were cursing yourself. 
most people today who speak English in all of its myriad varieties and derivations do not believe this, and English has only a tenuous tie to Latin as it is predominantly a Germanic language. In fact, despite some random pieces of poetry, the continued popularity of sandals, and an occasional fragment of political philosophy, most people today have nothing in common with the average ancient Roman. Unless most of you watching this today have covered your houses in penis frescoes and wind chimes, and you just haven't mentioned it to anybody. And yet, that 2,000-year-old random piece of Roman religious trivia has been preserved, almost unchanged, in a common phrase used to this very day by millions of people, with probably no idea what it references. We're not praying to Zeus much these days, but on the wrong foot didn't fall from the sky in 1780 either. Hand talkers are not 3,000-year-old rock carvings, but they are demonstrably preserving fragments of a symbolic system that shares a common ancestry with those once familiar and straightforward petroglyphs. Further, I'm not saying that 800 years ago native tribes all sat down and invented their own much better version of the Americans with Disabilities Act. The course of Wovoka's proselytizing demonstrates pretty conclusively that plain sign was developed to maintain trade relations, and it was very obviously spoken by predominantly hearing participants. They didn't create hand talk out of some accommodationist philosophy. However, by the same token, a deaf native would have significantly more access to daily activities specifically because hand talk existed and was in no way baffling or exceptional to the bulk of the communities around them. They were integrated into our group in a way unthinkable to the average European of the period. This is not to suggest that deaf natives are somehow walking time capsules, to be valued primarily for their ability to translate artwork for the rest of us. Much like many deaf people today, deaf natives of the period may have had their own distinct cultural tropes and internal narratives, which helped to shape an entirely separate dialect or dialects, just like any other language, including American Sign Language. The simple fact is, there's just no way to know at this point. So no, they are not our own personal walking memory sticks or proof of a kinder, gentler native, but they are people who were a respected part of our story in a way that they are demonstrably not now. As such, if we're looking to those who are marginalized in the community to this very day, but who shouldn't be, because until European contact, they wouldn't have been ostracized as they are, deaf natives and the deaf community in general is, you know, right there visibly invisible the entire time. It also means we have to completely reevaluate what other statistically abnormal biologies and traits simply would not have been so overtly categorized as such in native populations who wouldn't have cared or would have already incidentally accommodated their condition as simply a part of daily life. Fam, real talk, decolonization is about more than yelling at white people on Twitter about the Atlanta Braves logo. For example, I know about the COZAD letter because I was designing a hypothetical immersive plain sign museum exhibit in grad school. I came up with the idea based on knowing someone who worked with McKay Cody during her field research and thinking the history was really compelling and worthy of discussion when they told me about it. It matters that hand talk does not get a chapter in Custer Died for Your Sins or Red Earth White Lies. In fact, the bulk of this video was based on a presentation I gave on Plains Indian Sign, pre-contact Caribbean trade, and their potential utility in designing more immersive and minority-inclusive models for museum. And one of the few texts I could get a hold of at the time for reference material was the glorified pamphlet Indian Sign Language by Robert Hofsindi, which was published 60 years ago. Occasionally, articles like Alan Taylor's Nonverbal Communication in Aboriginal North America, The Plain Sign Language, which appeared in Aboriginal Sign Languages of the Americas and Australia, edited by the Seabox from 1978, and J.E. Davis's Hand Talk, Sign Language Among American Indian Nations in 2010, they've helped to form a thin spine of literature on the subject. But in the activist community, academically, culturally, Bella Kozad is not on hardly anyone's radar. Or to restate that in more leftist jargon, if your decolonial and class critical praxis does not overtly challenge the literacy standards of Exploration Age Europe, it is perpetuating de facto neocolonial oppression and disenfranchisement. When I first saw a digitized version of the letter, I was a little shocked to realize I recognized some of the symbols, because I don't speak plain sign. I'm not a member of the peyote religion, but I knew many of those images the same way most of you know why Nuka-Cola in the Fallout franchise is a pun. It's just part of your mental furniture. 
the reality is this letter represents a significant part of our collective history and is probably one of thousands which are gone forever. The knowledge of my people and that of my friends and cousins and acquaintances is possibly just gone. I don't know if there's a word for feeling simultaneously tantalized, emboldened, vindicated, disgusted, and infuriated, but if there is, I haven't found it. We were never savages. We were written that way by others. And then we read the story back to ourselves and we believed it. I think it's high time we start telling our own stories our way. If you're interested in knowing more about this subject, I've included several links in the down below, as well as a few texts that are mostly out of print, but that maybe you'll be able to find at your local library. It's nowhere near a comprehensive list of all the resources on the subject, but it should be enough to get someone started. I also want to mention that I got a little bit of inspiration from at Javardi's thread on non-European sign languages, such as those used in the Ottoman court and at Museum Weirdo's thread on painting interpretation through the meaning of sex weasels in Renaissance art, and most definitely the brilliant research of PhD linguist Melanie McKay Cody and her efforts to revitalize PISL. If you are so inclined, I have also included a link to my Patreon at the bottom of the links, and the like and subscribe buttons are also always an available option. With that, I thank you for watching. I hope you are safe. I hope you are in a supportive place, and I hope you have fun.